Hello and welcome to this episode of the L&D Leaders Lounge podcast brought to you by Hensley Fraser. In this episode, we're talking about everything AI, the good, the bad and the ugly with our subject matter experts, Laura Walker, Ben George and Matthew Prisco. Uh, so we're going to start by looking at the good. And if I could come to you first, Ben, for this one, uh, just to give us an overview of what we mean by generative AI. Um, and some sort of broad understanding of how it's being utilised in learning and development. Thanks, John. So I think there are a few different definitions floating around at the moment about what generative AI means. But you know, the way that I think many folks see it is that it refers to models or tools that can create content and ideas based on uh, training data, but not just on that. So they're able to generate information and content that is new from data that's been that has been trained on so in l d these models offer potential for um certainly for content generation personalization things like predictive analysis and enhancing both things like teaching and you know better learning experiences Thank you, Ben. Uh, and could we just stay with you, Ben, actually, just to talk more specifically then based on that, um, some of your experiences or insights or even user cases or for generative AI within L&D, what's worked, what hasn't worked? Yeah, so it's it's been a, it's, so we've been working on this since January and using particularly ChatGPT 3.5 and then more recently 4. Um, significantly to help us with design architectures and outlines and programs with our clients. So, you know, essentially it, it's speeding up the process, enabling us to get things done um, more efficiently, um, often more in a more creative way than how we've been able to do it before. And ultimately this gives our clients a better, a better bang for their buck. Um, and some specific things that we've used it for beyond you know architectures and outlines for programs have been uh you know, i remember one session recently where we were delivering a a human-centered design workshop in in paris and we used chat gpt to help facilitate ideation so rather than just using standard techniques like random word um, inputs and brainstorming techniques we use chat gpt to supercharge the the kind of experience and come up with these amazing ideas that we, we just we just weren't able to do even with a group of 14 in a room. Um, so it, it's huge. Also performance tools as well. It's an, it's a, it, it enables people to to create performance tools like a, a manager checklist for the first 90 days. Um, it builds these tools really, really quickly. People can go use them straight away in the in the real world. And just to follow up on that, when you used it with a in a room, Ben, with the 14 people, was was there any resistance amongst the group or was everybody everybody so familiar or comfortable with it now that there wasn't any any issues on that front? Some people had never seen it before, so it was a new introductory tool. Some of the IT uh, uh, engineers and engineer managers, software engineer managers had been using it for a while in their own um, for their own use. So there wasn't so much resistance. I think it was more curious to see and, you know, explore the outcomes in terms of effectiveness right so yeah i think it's more of a curiosity thing just hugely powerful and exciting to have this extra sort of augmented you know tool that helps you do your job so, uh, and matthew are you hearing uh similar good experiences from i mean i know you talk to a lot of our clients and obviously you're involved on the product side of things for hemsley do you hear similar things are clients using them in a similar way to the way Ben described or are there, are there other user cases? Yeah, I think as as Ben's alluded to, um, I think you know, AI has been around for a long time, but certainly over the last six to 12 months particularly, it's really gone, you know, there's that exponential growth in its presence in the workplace. Um, and that's having quite a dramatic impact on how people are thinking about utilising tools like this, the opportunity it presents, Kind of some of the threats it also presents. Um, so absolutely, um, I mean, from a product perspective, we see, you know, we're trying to work out, you know, what does this mean to our product capability? How do we create content more quickly and efficiently? 
How does it add academic rigor to the content uh, that we're producing? How do we use it, you know, uh, as a tool to enhance what we've already got? So I think, you know, to Ben's point, we're seeing it very much as a, as a tool. It's not a replacement for anything per se, or in fact, maybe that's not correct. It is replacing some things, but you know, we very much see it as a tool that's going to enhance our capability from a product perspective. And I think, you know, that's the way that, you know, L&D and every other industry should be looking at it just as a fantastic opportunity because we're very much in the foothills of where this is going to go. It's just going to increasingly get better and better uh, as more and more data gets put into these systems. And final one on this, Ben. Um, just because you, you mentioned sort of design, using it for design architecture, and I, I think earlier on you talked about sort of giving it initial data to, to create this content. Does that mean other implications there for us to be even more precise in what we're doing at the outset to make it produce something relevant and interesting? Or is it so productive we can just keep throwing things in there? Nice question, John. I think the, the 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 hot skill for this year or for the first six months of this year seems to be this idea of prompt engineering. I don't think many of us had heard of that term in last year, even at the end of last year. So essentially, it, yeah, it's your ability to create effective prompts that give you the quality of the output. So, for example, if you if you if you want it to be um, producing high quality content on conflict resolution. Um, and you know, for, to help managers, then you need to prompt it um, to be able to do that effectively. Yeah, interesting. Great. Um, Laura, if I could come to you, uh, just to then, uh, I mean, it might lead into what okay. Ben was just talking about, but the current limitations and challenges that you've seen of using generative generative AI within L and D. Any examples or things that you've seen happening with the clients you work with? Yeah, I mean, I think there are quite a few limitations at the moment because obviously we're in the foothills of this um, technology. But a few that I would highlight uh, for the purposes of L and D, particular, uh, would be around issues around the the content um, and content bias specifically. So obviously, it works on the data that's in there. So if the quality of the data isn't there um, or it's out of date, so some of the tools can only go back as far as 2020, um, 2021, for example. So if you're working on something that's new and emerging, there might be restrictions on that. Obviously, the algorithm itself could be biased. So, for example, some of the things I do around age discrimination or gender discrimination can be built in. So, for example, if you've got um, data around potential, it would be very unusual not to have something in there about drive and ambition. So if you're talking about career um, ambition, for example, that means very different things for different genders and for minority groups. So you can be building in bias into the algorithm or the way the data is analysed. And I think you can also have human bias in there, too. So in terms of the people who are generate, putting the data in that the system uses may also be of a, a particular orientation or may not have the full perspective um, of content that you need. So I think there's some issues around, you know, just concerns uh, about that. So just a healthy scepticism is probably what we really need um, about the data that we get out. In my experience, I've found that it is a good starting point. So if you're if you're just starting to think about an article, for example, if I'm writing an article or a point of view on something, it can be a good starting point. But for me, honestly, if I'm writing a brand new point of view on something, some fresh insight that doesn't already exist, it takes me about 20, 30 percent there. It doesn't actually do the majority of the work around the compelling narrative, the new perspective, the different perspectives that you get from a truly diverse group of people having a conversation um, together. But it does get you off the off the blank page, I'd say. So it's a reasonable yeah. um, starting point. I think the other thing that I would say that you know the other key concern beyond um, content is really around that you can't really explain the transparency. Uh, one of the criticisms that's been laid against generative AI is the lack of explainability. So if you're trying to explain how you've got to something, it's quite difficult to do because it's it's embedded within the process itself. 
Um, so I think having that transparency and telling, showing your workings, basically, and being able to say how you've got to where you've got to, there are some limitations behind that. And for where you're trying to shift human behaviour, for example, and bring people on the journey um, around a shift in perspective or um, habits, it's really helpful if you can explain where you've how you've got to where you've got to. So I think there are a few limitations um, that are coming. But I think, you know, it's helpful to have that kind of critical eye on, on anything, whether it's generative AI, AI or something else. Yeah, that, that showed your work is really interesting, actually. It kind of leads me into the next the next thought is around, is there any evidence um, that a, a, an over-reliance or indeed a reliance, I guess, on generative AI can lead to sort of a reduction in certain skills like uh, within your human workforce, creativity or critical thinking, or is it is it still a bit early for that sort of uh, assumption to be made? Yeah, I haven't seen any direct data um, specifically, but if you think about how learning works, particularly around complex problem solving. So complex problem solving, we know, is the number one skill, um, and it has been for several years, that um, the World Economic Forum have identified as the top 10 skills. Complex problem solving is always high on that. And the point being, it's a unique problem. So in a way, you know, generative AI could be an opportunity around that. But because it's brand new, some of the risks that I mentioned earlier could come in. So you might not have the, the most up to date information in the system to then pull that through into your into your insight. And the other thing about learning, particularly around learning agility. So um, the number one predictor of potential is your ability to do experience new and different things, make sense of that learning and then apply that learning in new and different contexts. What worries me a little bit about AI, if I'm honest, is that making sense. So as, as you're putting something into a chat, for example, and it pops out, there's the answer. Where's the sense making that goes into that? You know, where are you connecting with your own experiences and building that learning into your own psyche and your own mental model around how things work to then be able to apply it in a new and different context? I fear that that um, expansion of the learning journey could be at, at risk if we're not careful around this. Ben, could I come to you? Have you any thoughts on that in terms of it within? Because obviously you've been using it directly within an LLD environment. Do you see that as an issue or are you taking a slightly different perspective? On um, I, I just see this as a tool that can help. And it's it's it seems to be. It seems to need at the moment expertise, um, an eyes of, you know, a considered eye to help it and to help you achieve an outcome, whatever that outcome is, content creation, strategic design, um, learning programs, you know. Um, and I think at the moment, there is a need to have an expert eye. And I think how we use it, I know universities, for example, are, are sort of still working through this. So the students aren't just submitting, you know, high quality, um, assignments essentially using chat gpt and they're not using their own critical skills and you know that's what education is for i guess in that regard but um yeah i think there's just some caution around any anything any new technology you could argue that calculators you know when they were introduced you know <laughs> it hasn't it, ha it hasn't affected um how kids do math these days we just use it to facilitate and support um, and i think that's what this tool will do but i think there's a there's also you know, this is a lot more advanced than a, than a calculator. This is essentially um, going to have the potential to disrupt you know, workforces. And there's going to be a, a need to reskill or upskill people, um, uh, you know, in much more uh, in a much more focused way um, to, to, to maximize the, all of the change. You know, ChatGPT 5 is coming at the end of the year. They've put patents in in July. Um, that essentially will be equivalent to human intelligence because at the moment generative AI can fix tasks. You prompt it and it fixes a task. This would be able to fix multiple tasks. Yeah. So there's there's this essentially human intelligence that we're going to be working with, and it's 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 just to be considered. I think to Laura's point is just it, it's a tool to use 
that can help support you. It's not everything at the moment, um, but for how long that 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 point stays there, I'm not quite sure. The future's uncertain but exciting, John. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a very nice positive spin on that, Ben. Uh, Matthew, on that, because Ben was talking there about the disruption of the workforce potentially um, and upskilling, I guess, in particular. Uh, any thoughts then about uh, within the L&D sector? Are there any other concerns already out there about the potential effect of generative AI on jobs or the L&D workforce that you've come across? Uh, I would say yes. Um, to Ben's point and to Laura's point, I think, you know, one of the things that we're really looking at is that upskilling requirement to be familiar with the technology, understand how to use it, in what context to use it and you know, ultimately kind of create relevance from it. Because having the tool is one thing. I agree it's a much more sophisticated, sophisticated calculator, but, you know, you need to know what to put into the calculator in the first place to get an answer. And I think that's the same thing. And, you know, I think it goes broader than L&D. If we think about the jobs of today, to, to to Laura's point, you know, it's kind of critical thinking and problem solving. You know, it's because organisations are changing and society is changing at such a rapid pace. I know we've been talking about this for some time since post pandemic. I think it's just been fast forwarded, and you know, this is just another iteration of that. Because I think, you know, if you if you look at the research that's coming out of lots of different places, including the Economist uh, and, and the consulting organisations, this um, sort of theme of this next industrial revolution you know this digital transformation is just gathering more and more momentum so I think that has a de direct impact on us as an L&D kind of uh, you know the, the L&D community thinking about how do we make sense of that how do we support organizations understand the transformation that's going on in and around how they're doing business what their employees need to do how they need to engage with customers there's a whole if you think about it, everything is connected back to more and more learning and upskilling requirements. So, you know, as we pick our way through this, absolutely the skills of the L&D function are changing, but they've been changing quickly anyway. You know, if you think about the, the, the skill set that you need today, it's so different to what it was five, ten years ago. It's incredibly different. So yeah. um, I think, you know, the, the generative AI is going to be helpful in that, but it is going to make change the direction of you know what skill sets you need to have to be an efficient L&D practitioner. It, it, sound, it sounds a little bit like this sort of whether it's an opportunity or threat is based on your perception how you react yeah. to it rather than yeah you know, well, you know the Chinese proverb where, where there's an uh, where there's a, a threat there's an opportunity I think so I think if, if you if you remain static and passive to it then it was definitely going to become a threat to you but if you can understand it and start to adopt it and think about how it can benefit you your team your organization then you know you have to kind of approach it with the right mindset i think because this this thing's not going to go away and, and, and as laura or and ben has alluded to we're very much in the foothills of this technology it's just going to get better and better and better so what does that mean for us and how do we you know the, what, what we think is you know as Hemsley fraser is thinking about how do we put the human into the digital component so because I think Laura's mentioning it, the skill sets that we have, absolutely. If you think about the, the leadership programs that we're developing at the moment, uh, there's a huge importance in around kind of creating human leadership. Now, that's a little broad term, but kind of the more mm -hmm. skill, the, the, the different skills that you need to have as a leader today. And it's it's not it, it, it's a different skill set to, to what it was five years ago. So, some are sort of evergreen, but there's certainly new skills. Uh, but, uh, different skills that you need to have to be an effective leader and I think you know understanding the digital transformation and uh, the impact of these tools is part of that transformation. And just to sort of cover off a few of the sort of um, potential social and ethical considerations any any input on that Matthew if I come to you first and then we'll go to law in terms of yeah and I think bit. Yeah, for me it's a, there's a few points here you know if you think about, you know, as an example of what we're doing at the moment, we are tra transferring our um, fluid books, our, our, our written t text into audio books. Now, historically, we would have done that using a whole team of people. Uh, we would have actors or voiceover artists providing that. And now with, you know, generative AI, we could, well, um, 
we can just feed it into the machine and we get really good content coming back, you know, kind of ready to go pretty much with some minor tweaking. So that kind of has, you know, to your earlier question, that has an immediate impact on the skill sets that we're employing as a, as an organisation. You know, we don't need a team of people anymore. We can just use the tool. So that makes it more quick, more efficient. You know, ethically, does that put people out of jobs? Potentially, you know, um, are we not going to do that? No, is probably the, real, the real, realistic answer to that. And then the other point is, you know, Ben alluded to the sort of university homework kind of scenario and Laura's working out kind of what is the, you know, if you think about if we're presenting content to an organisation that MG Fraser has written, historically we have done that through an associate network, all of our experts, we know it's coming from a very secure, credible source. Whereas when you're kind of going to more open AI and kind of uh, input from elsewhere, you can't show the workings out. So, you know, you have to be a little bit careful about the content uh, being accurate, being correct. And I think that's where Ben's point and Laura's point comes into the equation, which is you still need an expert to validate what that text is saying or that output is saying and just making sure that that, yep, that's right. Or tweaking it again to add to the context and relevance of how how it's being portrayed to the end user ultimately. Mm. Laura, anything to add to that? Because I know you, you obviously were talking about that uh, can't see the working out, um, but anything around sort of that loss of control or or transparency, if you like, um, that we're seeing within L&D's use of generative AI? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's just starting, but I think for me, having, I mean, control and transparency, having worked in very regulated industries. So, you know, I've worked in pharmaceuticals, defence, um, engineering companies where, you know, intellectual property and noting of sources and digging into the rigour and the reliability of the data that we then use is absolutely critical. And I think, you know, obviously that's had an impact on me. So when I'm, you know, looking at what comes out of the generative AI tools that um, that I've been playing with, because I'm, I'm curious about these things, so I have been playing with them. Um, sometimes that's just not very transparent and you don't know. So that's the thing that worries me is you don't know. On one hand, you don't really know a lot of the sources that are being pulled together or they're being obviously connected and linked together. So they're not the same as the original source. So there are links being made that you can't really see. But also, you know, from a, an author point of view and a writer point of view, a lot of the things are not given credit. So we talked about, you know, where you can have actors who are put into a different context and then suddenly that's them acting it well obviously it's not and you know as an author my content can be taken and and changed and attributed to me and how would I even know so I think there's there's a lot of the the kind of human experience aspects that impacts the individuals um who are who are working in, in in a public way so I think there's it's just having that really continuing to have that rigor and that skepticism around the the content and continuing to work, I think, with the tools and with the developers of the tools to make sure that they are taking into account the uh, the rigour and the intellectual property that sits behind some of these things. Yeah. Yeah. And final thing, I mean, Ben, you've already said the future is exciting, but we don't we're not sure what the future is. But I'm going to come to you with a long term question. Um, looking forward, as much you know from what we know at the moment and what we can see coming are there any sort of long-term uh, consequences or maybe even benefits that we can see at the moment already of, of using generative ai within lmd that we could already be starting to think about mitigating I, i'm i'm blinded by the benefits john um okay. if I'm quite, I'm quite honest um although i've experienced the um essentially the um when it first came out i was um really blown away by it and probably went through the dunning kruger effect of high expectations and actually got a little bit real about what it could do which i think a lot of people do when they get excited about new tech uh, but i think the con in terms of consequences or long-term consequences um for l and d i i think it's i think i think i can only see the role of l d in the upskilling and reskilling phase in terms of you know are they equipped are l d teams equipped to use this technology um and are they adopting it effectively and if they're not 
and others are and they're using it well i think there are consequences there for those for those teams that are i wouldn't say laggards but aren't folks that are really trying to explore so i think i think it's going to separate um i think it's going to separate those that will adopt and use effectively and that will accelerate their progress and effectiveness in support of the organizations that they're working in and folks that aren't will be using tools that that we've been using for for a while um and i think that the differences will show up there quite significantly so it's i guess my, my message is try and get on board with it be curious like laura said and, and matthew have mentioned as well this and and i guess think about ways with your teams to 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 utilize this effectively to 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 increase your return on investment for the organization laura to build upon that yeah yeah so um for me a future trend a kind of long-term potential implication is already grounded in our current reality so within l d one of the current issues that we have is that people get overwhelmed by the content that is available and that is already an issue so that generative ai has the potential to make that even worse so and the cut through to help learners know what is what is the most important learning for them rather than just overwhelming them so more content is not more in terms of the impact that it has on learning and I think for me, there is a risk around how we make sure that we are taking and addressing that trend to develop fresh quality insight that is not just more content. So how do we help people to cut through? And maybe there's a way of using generative AI to help with that. But I think there's there's a real risk that that trend that is already there just gets worse. And how do we help people to navigate You know what really is the most important thing that they need to know about their job or about the future job or about the possibilities in their career in the future. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And Matthew, can I just come, because I know some of the things Laura mentioned there, we were actually talking about in another meeting yesterday in re regards to Hensley's sort of way of dealing with that. Some final comments for you based on that in terms of the yeah, volume it, and quantity of content? Yeah, I'd agree with everything Ben and Laura just said, you know, Ultimately, L&D's job is to kind of create or present content that's relevant and contextualised to them, to their team, to that individual, to that business. And, you know, there is a tsunami of content available uh, through many different mediums and platforms, both internally and externally outside of organisations. And I think, you know, people are increasingly busy as you know the, the the workload is not diminishing um people are operationally stretched you know there, there's some constant themes that we see through all industries all organizations it's just that is the state of play at the moment in society so you know what what we think is really important from a learning perspective is just trying to cut through some of that noise trying to create programs initiatives learning experiences and opportunities that really you know kind of get to the point quickly are great to be part of you know you have a really positive experience and you know follow some fairly traditional kind of uh, methodologies I guess you know Henry Fraser's famous excite engage in bed you know still very much relevant even with this increased uh, you know technology availability it's really about how do you get capture people's attention how do you get them to understand the subject and then most importantly how do you get them to apply it? And you know, as we've been saying all along, I think this tool is something that can certainly help. It could be a hindrance. It could be just you know trying to drink from the far hose. That just could be too much, too soon. <laughs> uh, so you know, I think yeah, part of LND's job is to try and cut through some of that noise, create the the space that you need to do effective learning. Uh, and to think of it in the context of you know how really people are going to use this. So you know, we're, we're, as a product function. We think it's a brilliant opportunity and it's going to provide us with huge amounts of new content and services using uh, uh, generative AI as the uh, foundation stone. Well, thank you all. Um, we're, we're at the end of our time. I feel like we could go on for a lot longer. Uh, feels like we've uh, just started the conversation, but as we've all alluded to, especially Ben, you were saying, it's changing every day. So we could have this conversation again in six months time, I'm sure. But for now, Thank you very much for your time. Really interesting. I've written down lots of new terms that I hadn't heard of before, so I'll be using them throughout the rest of the week. So thanks for your time. Really interesting and hopefully speak to you all again soon. Thank you.